Hi, I'm Rick Green. This is the story of the day that I got to meet a hero. That hero is George Remy, better known by his nom de plume, Hergé, or universally known as the creator of Tintin. Yes, Tintin, Hergé's masterpiece. At the time, I'm 23, I'm backpacking all over Europe with my URL pass. Oh, URL pass, any train to anywhere. As I'm coming up on the midpoint of my two-month journey, what starts out as a frustrating day actually turns into the highlight of my whole Europe adventure. In fact, it might be the highlight of my 1976. What surprises me, looking back even today or even a few months after I got home, was how out of character it seemed. I had spent a lot of time preparing for this grand tour of Europe because I was sure I wouldn't be going back for a long time. But with all the planning and research that I'd done, checking out destinations, the trip was actually rather spontaneous, sort of. I had lots of options. So I had a good list of cities that I wanted to see, and I had a list of what I wanted to see in each city. More than I could possibly see in two weeks in any one city, but that's okay. Options, options, options. I like having options. And I had no concrete schedule. Five days in Paris, a week, two, depends. I would decide each morning where I was going. Am I leaving town? Am I staying? If I'm staying, what am I going to see? Always open to the possibility that I might be sidetracked by something more interesting along the way. And what interested me when I was planning the trip was different from what I felt on any particular morning. So options. I liked having options. Freedom. So it was a strange mix of being well organized, well prepared, and yet free to follow any particular whim of the day. Tired of museums? Yeah, let's go off the Swiss Alps. Which train do I need to take? And off I go. For example, about three weeks into the journey, I decided to pay a unannounced and surely unwanted by him visit to this world-renowned writer and artist, Hergé. Was this chutzpah, uh, naivety, sheer goal? Probably. Is there something about being so far from home that makes us take chances we might not take at home? Dutch courage, or in this case, Belgian courage. Even today, I'm pretty cautious about a lot of things, and yet also fairly spontaneous or open to doing things that a lot of people would find alarming. So horror movies, no thanks, too scary for me. But I'm happy, actually, even energized to get up in front of a thousand people and give a talk or perform in a show. To me, that's just... Ah. So on July 28th, I activate my URL pass and I take the train to Paris for a few days. I jaunt off to Chartres and then, well... What have we got? I look through, there's a late train that will deliver me to Brussels at seven in the morning, which means the hostels and the small hotels will be emptying out and I can do my standard new city protocol. Store my backpack in a locker at this train station, go find a room nearby just for a few days, then come back, grab my backpack, take it, settle into the room, get some food, and then go sightseeing. Only I can't find a room, not in my price range, and the city is hot. It is very hot. Apparently, Brussels is baking. And unlike in London, there seems to be no equivalent in Belgium of the stoop and scoop. So after a few hours of traipsing around this minefield of hot dog droppings in the heat, I decide, eh, time to move on. I take a quick look at the schedule. Where could I go next? Ah, Munich, right. I could leave on the 11.45 train, get in early in the morning in Munich. Maybe there'll be hotels free there. So then I go sightseeing. Lunchtime finds me in a cheap cafe, which is what I can afford, eating delicious food, which is why you got to love Europe. And I'm wondering what I'm going to do. I'm museumed out and then, plink, my memory throws up a bit of information. Hergé, 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 yes, Hergé, he lives in Brussels and I know his name. It's actually George Remy. And George Remy, if you reverse the initials, R-G in French, that's pronounced, yes, you guessed it, Hergé. Aha. I wonder if I can go see him. Maybe he's in the phone book. It's 1976. They had phone books. So I'm in this booth scrolling. George Remy, are you? No. Okay. Uh, what about Tintin? No, nothing. Uh, Hergé? See Studio Hergé. <laughs> Studio Hergé. Oh, baby. I don't have any Belgian coins for a call, and my French is très pauvre. 
but brilliant compared to my Flemish. So I write down the address and I walk up to a policeman for help. And he's very abrupt, not polite and helpful like a Mountie would be. And years later, I realize it's because Europe is locked down in this constant low-grade war with terrorists that occasionally becomes high-grade. So cops are not overly friendly. So I use a bit of French on the Belgian policeman, and then I point to the address on the piece of paper, and he gives me the directions. I don't even know if it was French or Belgian. It went very quickly. But I did hear at the wall, which I know is right, and gauche is left. Troisième means third. So I walk for a while with a growing sense I'm lost until, ta-da, a corner store that sells maps of Brussels because it turns out, yes, I am lost. So I look through. Okay, I find it finally. There it is. Ten minutes later, I'm standing outside of this classic European building, you know, six stories high maximum because they're all built before there were elevators with the beam hanging on the front because everything had to go up on the outside and then in through doors. And I'm looking and it says, Studio RG, troisième étage. Third floor. I go inside and there is an elevator. A lot of buildings have them. They're retrofitted in. It's tiny, about the size of the phone booth I was in. One, two people at most. I get in and it says Studio Hergé on the button. I push the button and up I go. Things are going by. Premier étage, deuxième étage. It's very slow. Troisième étage. The door opens. Oh, actually, no, it didn't. You had to push the door open. I step out into a hallway and it goes off to my left and to my right. There's a display case at the end of the hall here and it's a glass display case and it's full of stuff. Crab with golden claws, the shooting star. There was all of these little models, which is what the artists would use when they were drawing reference models. So I look around and then finally a woman coming out and spots me. She comes down. Bonjour, comment ça va? Um, or whatever she asked. And then I explain, oh, je suis canadienne et est-ce possible pour moi uh, to meet to um, Monsieur Hergé, Miss George, uh, you know, and, oh, uh, très busy, très uh, I said, I've come all the way from Canada. Oh, maman, s'il vous plaît. That's in a moment, if you please. She disappears, she goes into a door. And it's more than a minute. Finally, she comes back. Vous retournez à quatre heures. Four o'clock, quatre, four o'clock. Oui, four, quatre, 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 quatre. Oui, je suis retourné à quatre heures. Merci, merci, merci. I get back in the elevator. I'm going to meet him. Oh my God, I can't believe I'm going to meet him. He was down that hall. He must be in that room. So now it's early afternoon. So I stop and grab some pastry because I'm in Europe, that's all you eat. And I eat the pastries, I'm sitting in the park, and the mind is going, what am I going to say? What am I going to ask? And I'm rehearsing everything, because I want to get the most out of this. And I don't think I actually said any of it when I got in there, but that's okay. Finally, finally, quarter to four. So I cross and stand in front of the building. Five to four. I go over, I take the elevator, I figure five minutes, it's a slow elevator. I get in, close the door, troisième étage, studio Hergé. They probably don't have that much phlegm. That was more Munich and, and Holland. Anyway, uh, so up I go, I step out. Uh, she, ah, un moment, s'il vous plaît. I had to wait a minute until somebody came out. It was her, she said something. Uh, she disappeared and I waited yeah, for just for a minute and then six minutes and then 10 or 11 minutes, and I'm thinking, oh, oh well, I got clothes. And should I leave or, no, no, don't leave, you got nowhere else to go. The train doesn't leave for it. Yes, oh, follow me. So I follow her, she, second door in, I go, and I walk in, and the room's quite big, probably, I don't know, maybe it was 20 by 20, uh, maybe bigger. Big desk on one side, uh, where Hergé is sitting, behind him a bust of Tintin uh, carved out of stone. And I came in and he greeted me and we sat down and we talked a little bit. He asked me uh, uh, some questions. One of the questions was, what was my favorite uh, favorite moment? And I said, oh, what did I like the best? And I, I said, it's in uh, Tintin in Tibet where they're playing chess and then Tintin 
falls asleep because it's taking so long for Captain Haddock. And then he has a dream about Chang, this kid he knows was in uh, Tibet. And he wakes up and he yells, Chang. And everywhere, everybody is leaping all over the place, except, as you can see, Professor Tornesal in French or Professor Calculus. And I said, because he's deaf, he said, no, no, no. He's a little hard of hearing, which is, of course, the uh, what he keeps telling people until he gets an ear trumpet. And then a... So we talked for actually uh, probably 15 or 20 minutes, and it was great talking to him. I have no memory of what I said. I just remember how gracious he was. And there was this whimsical twinkle in his eye, and I'm sure I was like, <laughs> as well. And then I said, this is where I got a little courage. I said, could I have an autograph? And he said, uh, and he took out a little piece of paper. It's about, I don't know, postcard size, probably, maybe a bit bigger. And he starts to draw. He starts a line and another line and another line. And I realize he's drawing something. I said, well, just your signature. And he said, this is my signature. And he signed it to my brother, Andy Green, with all the best wishes from Hergé. So it was the 4th of August of 76. Wow. Uh, so I so he hands this to me, and it's just like, wow. I mean, if I lose my passport, I can replace my passport. But this, you know, I'm not coming back here. So I thanked him profusely. I went out, and I was just glowing. I don't remember the rest of the day. Anyway, the reason I mention this is because uh, at the time and afterwards, I thought that was so unlike me, but it wasn't really unlike me. I had structure, I was prepared for the rejection, which if you're a comedian, you'll get a lot of. And yet I had a solid structure, a foundation. I knew his name. Uh, I didn't know where this place was. I never thought of it, but I had nothing else to do. So I took a chance. Anyway, that's my story. My first real brush with celebrity and uh, was epic. Fast forward to 20, whatever it was, 16, 15. And the, we're watching the Tintin movie. And it opens with Tintin sitting there having a drawing being done in a marketplace, uh, like a flea market, by an artist. And the camera pans around. And the, and I couldn't remember at that point what, what George Remy looked like. But when the camera panned around, I went, oh, that's him. That's him. Like, flash. They did a beautiful job of capturing him. So anyway, my advice is be prepared and be spontaneous. Thanks for making it to the end of this story. If you want to hear more about anything, become a patron and support what I do. You can have a say in the topics that we address. And you'll also get exclusive access to the webinars that we do with guest experts or just with the Patreon community. And as well, we have the chat rooms where you are immersed with a group of very creative people. Oh, yeah, and the Friday Funnies. Subscribe to the Friday Funnies. They're funny. Not as funny as some of the stuff in this. The seven crystal balls. Huh? Ah, yeah. Mm.